Uh, so we are live now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody who are watching us from YouTube, and a good afternoon, uh, Professor Bhavani. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. So as we know that uh, we are having, we are at the fourth day of the webinar series on marine pollution and conservation research, uh, and this is uh, we are doing. Uh, to celebrate uh, the International Coastal Cleanup Day, which is uh, happening every third Saturday of uh, September. So a uh, very warm welcome to you, ma'am. And uh, my name is Pooja Shinde. I work for United Way Mumbai. And uh, on, the, on the behalf of uh, entire United Way Mumbai and NCCR, uh, we are welcoming you for this today's session. Thank you, Pooja. Yes. Uh, so uh, we, as I uh, told you in the beginning that uh, we are doing this webinar series uh, in collaboration with NCCR. So I will just quickly uh, run through uh, about the United Way Mumbai and uh, then we can begin the session. Yes. Okay. So um, United Way Mumbai is a nonprofit organization which is working from last 17 years in Mumbai and it's a global movement. It's a part of a global movement and spanning across uh, 41 countries in the world. And our mission is to improve lives by mobilizing the caring power of the communities to advance the common good. Now we work in uh, United Way Mumbai works in six focus areas that includes education, health, income, environment, public safety, and social inclusion. So basically we work in a public private uh, partnership mode and uh, we have till now a 400 plus uh, NGOs who are working with us we have partnered with more than 300 plus companies and we have more than 1 lakh individual donors who are supporting us uh, in our different different interventions and uh, as I said, environment is also one of our focus areas and under environment, our, we have our special project that is known as Clean Shore Mumbai and we are working actively towards mitigating the marine pollution and conserving the marine biodiversity in Mumbai. So United Way, as the name suggests, Clean Shores Mumbai. So we are actively working towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, beach cleanup activities, keeping the how to keep our uh, beaches uh, clean. As we know that Mumbai, the Greater Mumbai has 114 kilometer of coastline and a 16 kilometer long beach stretch. And these beaches in Mumbai, and Mumbai being uh, the economic capital of uh, India, Mumbai has a uh, Day to day, we have a, a larger number of footfalls, heavy footfall numbers on the beaches. Uh, and these beaches are also called as chapatis. So this increased number of footfalls are also being very uh, challenging for the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai to keep the uh, cleanliness uh, of these beaches. That's why uh, this project Clean Shore Mumbai tries to maintain this cleanliness across the different beaches in Mumbai. And we have till now adopted seven beaches in Mumbai and we are working actively towards uh, maintaining the cleanliness, providing the supportive infrastructure, doing the beach beautification drive. And we have till now mobilized more than 10,000 uh, college students and corporate volunteers to uh, in this engaging activities. So uh, today we are gathered here uh, to celebrate the International Coastal Cleanup Day and we have Dr. Uh, Professor Bhavani with us. So I would like to introduce uh, Professor Bhavani. So Professor Bhavani Narayan Swami is a researcher in the field of deep sea ecology and microplastic research, her current interest includes investigating the prevalence and the impact of microplastics uh, in the global environment and also how to link uh, between uh, the communities and the key environment parameters such as grain size, the total oxygen content, etc. And she has also introduced the research into the occurrence of microplastic found uh, within or in fauna or sediments and water columns uh, by the deep sea, specifically in south, uh, Southwest Indian Ocean and uh, Northeast uh, Atlantic. So very warm welcome to you, ma'am. And uh, today, ma'am will be talking about the microplastic conditions in the global oceans. So very warm welcome to you, ma'am, once again. And this session is over to you. Thank you very much, Pooja. And thank you to um, NCCR and um, United Way Mumbai for inviting me to come and speak today. It's a great honor to come and speak. 
especially um, since it is the International Coastal Cleanup Day. So it really is something very special. I really appreciate all of you who have um, connected. I was going to say this morning, it's this morning for me here in the UK. I know it's the afternoon in India. Um, so I appreciate you connecting up on a Saturday afternoon to come and listen to me talk a little bit about some of the work that I've been, uh, been doing um, in my research. So I'm hoping that um, technology will work correctly and I'm going to share my screen and go through some slides with you. So I'm hoping, Pooja, you can tell me whether you can see my screen and it's sharing. Yes, ma'am, it's, it's visible. Brilliant, thank you very much. So um, I'm, as Pooja said, I'm a researcher at um, a place called the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Um, it's quite a mouthful, so it's shortened to SAMS. And we're located up here on the northwest coast of Scotland. You can see a map of the UK and this pin here indicates where my laboratory is. Um, it's a fantastic place to work. You can see this is actually my laboratory and we're surrounded by water and mountains um, on three sides. So it's a, a pretty special location um, and I'm very fortunate to work there. So today I want to talk a little bit about microplastics in the global ocean and some of the work that I and my students and my colleagues have been, have been undertaking. So I know that today is kind of the last day of um, talking about plastics and microplastics, but some of you may not have come to the talks um, in the webinars that's been undertaken earlier in the week. So just to reiterate, and I'm sorry if you already know this, but um, I thought I would start by saying, what are microplastics? So microplastics are small pieces of plastic that range in size from five millimeters down to one micron in diameter. Below one micron, they're known as nanoplastics. And this term was first introduced by uh, Richard Thompson back in 2004. I say back in 2004, it's actually only 16 years ago. So it's not that long ago that um, this term was being used. And on the right hand side of my slide, you can see um, some images that I've put in of um, fibers, um, of fragments of nurdles and other pellets um, that we term as microplastics. And just to note that um, plastics do not fully degrade, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So you might start with a plastic bottle um, known, as uh, known as mega sort of plastics, macroplastics, and they'll break down into these smaller particles, but they never really go away. So what is plastic made of? Um, I thought I'm not going to give you a, a chemistry lesson in, in plastics um, and how it's formed, but uh, as I was putting this together, I thought it was quite useful and I found it quite interesting just to see how um, plastics were actually made. So the first part of it is the um, extraction of the actual raw material, such as coal or natural gas, gas, but mainly actually crude oil is what is used. And the second stage is a refining process. And so this takes particularly the crude oil and it transforms it into um, different types of petroleum products. Product, sorry. And the crucial compound for plastic is actually naphtha. The third phase is called polymerization, and there are two types. There's addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. I'm not going to go into the differences between them, but it was more just to, to flag this up. Um, and it's just to say it's a process, an overall pro process, where light olefin gases, which are monomers, are converted into higher molecular weight hydrocarbons, which are polymers. And this is what's required for the production of plastic. And finally, you go into compounding or processing where there are various blends of materials are what's called melt blended together and are eventually turned into pellets. If you look down here in the right, right hand side of the slide, these are pellets or also known as nurdles. And so you'll have colorants added to these nurdles um, and then these are, are transported away. So I'm going to move my my image across slightly for this so that you can see. So the problems with pellets and nurdles are that they're easily lost. So in this schematic, it's quite useful to see. You start with oil, um, it's transported to your factory, which makes nurdles or the pellets. Um, 
but accidents are all, always happen and you sometimes spill some. Um, the pellets are then transported by lorry um, into another factory where perhaps they make um, bottles or computers. Um, again, there can be some more spills. They're also transported um, by lorries, perhaps to ships, so they can be taken around the world. Um, and again, accidents can happen at sea. So these pellets, these nurdles of about five millimeters in size are um, spilt quite frequently um, in transit and within the factory. And it's not very often that these um, nurdles can be recycled or collected because they've become dirty. Um, and so they're just wasted really. And that's again, a form of litter. So it's just a close up of nurdles. This is um, sort of clear plastic that you can see being held in somebody's hands. And these will then be used. Um, they'll be molded and blended together to create things such as our, our water bottles or soap that's contained um, or held in these sort of containers here. I flagged up about accidents at sea and this was an accident that took place back in 2012. Um, and a ship um, was, um, was sailing towards Hong Kong's, um, I think to Hong Kong, uh, when a typhoon hit it. And you know, on a transport ship, you have all your containers stacked up on the deck um, and some of the containers were knocked off the vessel. These were carrying these pellets, the containers split open um, and all these nurdles pellets were, were um, washing up on um, Hong Kong's Lama Island. And so locals were asked or tasked to go and, and clean up um, as many of these nurdles as possible, but it's not that easy to do and you will always miss some. Here in the UK, we have something called the Great Nurdle Hunt. Um, it's once a year where you go around to your local beaches and see how many nurdles you can pick up along the coastline. Where I live, um, strangely, we actually don't get very many nurdles, but further south, uh, there's actually quite a lot coming through the system. So again, just a schematic to show you the formation and breakdown of the plastics. You have um, your microplastics here, whether they come from a primary source, so such as the actual nurdles themselves. They've been used in personal care products and cleaning products um, in the UK and in, in many other countries as well. The, the pellets in or the, the beads that are used in personal care products are being phased out um, because it's been realized that they do actually cause a problem um, in the environment. But you can also get them from the breakdown of things like plastic bottles. So as you can see just here, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So I thought this morning, um, I actually took these photos a couple of days ago in preparation for this talk, but I thought I would see um, for my morning routine, how many times I actually touched some plastic um, before, um, before I started work. So uh, in the morning, the alarm goes off on my mobile phone, uh, which has a plastic cover. Um, from my phone, I can switch on my smart speaker to listen to the radio. Uh, it's temperature, as you'll probably guess here, is quite different to India. It's now getting quite cool in the morning. So I'm putting on a dressing gown to keep warm, uh, which is made of, of, it's a fleece one, so it's plastic. Um, and then I switch on the lights. Again, it's a plastic covering. And then I come downstairs, and this is quite um, an eye opener, really, that um, the milk, um, when I come and have breakfast, the milk is in a plastic container, the cereal comes in a plastic bag, as do the fruit. You might be wondering why I've got my um, teapot here. Well, many tea bags in the UK, some um, companies still have plastic within their paper mesh lining to retain the loose leaf tea within the bag. And this doesn't um, unsurprisingly degrade down. After breakfast, you go brush your teeth. Toothpaste um, comes in plastic tubes. I have an electric toothbrush. This begins to get quite, quite worrying, really. And then I get dressed. I put on my fleece because it's got quite cool now. And then I start work and I used a laptop, which is made of plastic. So that you can see in within an hour, and this isn't, I must admit, this isn't every single thing, um, item of plastic that I touched, but it just gives you an idea of how much um, plastic comes into our life on a daily basis. So if we take clothing as an example, so I've, 
I've also put in pictures of saris and silver camisas here as well, just to um, give an idea. Um, these all shed um, particles, especially you know, um, saris and silver camisas when they're made of synthetic fibers. No, not, not so often are you always wearing silk or cotton fibered um, or cotton material. It's more synthetic, it's quicker and easier to dry. We put them in our washing machine to clean and then what happens? So if you have a full washing machine um, of clothing, each washing machine can release over 700,000 fibers per wash. And that's just from one washing machine. So where do all those particles go? Well, they go, um, again, it depends slightly where you are in the world, but they'll go to a wastewater treatment work, um, as you can see here, and it will get cleaned as it goes through um, primary and secondary sort of um, meshes and cleaning systems. You'll get a solid disposal and at least in the UK and in Europe, this solid waste is then um, used as either goes to landfill or is actually used as fertilizer. So you begin to think that actually the micro the microfibers, which aren't actually all being collected by the filters on the wastewater treatment work, <clears throat> they come through and this solid waste will be disposed of on land. But at the same point, um, the liquid will come through and it's discharged um, as an effluent either into to rivers or the sea. And they have been fairly well cleaned, but we look at here, um, perhaps a wastewater treatment plant, just one may take in 8,000 million microplastics per day, which to my mind is a huge number. Um, and the treatment works are very good. They remove an awful lot of the, of the particles, but they are still able to release some in the vicinity of almost 600 million um, microplastic particles per day. And that's even after having this very good um, treatment being undertaken. So I had a quick look. This was a study undertaken in, in the States uh, on the East Coast um, in Charleston Harbor. And in Charleston Harbor alone, um, I think there are three wastewater treatment works in this, in this area and between 500 million and 1 billion microplastics are released each day from treated effluent. So from this one location, you multiply that up, that's 300, up to 365 billion particles released in a year from one area. I don't want to think about it too much globally because it's um, an, en an enormous number. So to come back to some of the work I've been doing then, this is an island called Tyree. Sorry, I'm just gonna move my picture so you can see. Um, again, this pin here is where I am and Tyree is this beautiful island off the west coast. Um, beautiful sand, um, coastlines, um, very rugged and they look pristine. I've looked very closely at this picture taken by my student. I can't see any large plastic items, um, but my student Lola has been looking at the, the sand um, and at the fauna. So she's been collecting mussels to investigate whether there are microplastics actually in this what looks like pristine environment. So as I said, she's been collecting mussels, um, she and another student have been going out and collecting water samples um, off Tyree and also other places along the west coast of Scotland and also from the sediment. And she's been very careful to make sure that um, there's no contamination and she has been finding particles in the water and in the sediment and in the mussels as well at all locations um, that she's been studying along the west coast. And some of them are what we would consider quite um, remote, quite pristine, but that doesn't seem to make much difference. We are still finding these particles. So moving from uh, the coastline out into the deep sea, this is um, where I've done quite a lot of work. We have um, been looking to see whether microplastics are found in the deep sea. So my old supervisor used to, um, undertake a huge amount of sampling in the Northeast Atlantic here. This is the Rockwell Trough region just here. And he was interested back in the mid 1970s, not in microplastics because it wasn't really known then, but actually about seasonality. And a colleague of ours actually kept the samples just in case they became useful 
uh, at a later date, and I'll come on to that in a minute. And we actually started sampling in 2013. So we have quite a lot of samples from this area. But we were focused on one station in particular here, just it's called Station M, it doesn't mean much, but it's, it's at a depth of 2,200 metres. Um, and my student was looking to see whether um, fauna at this station um, in the deep sea was actually going to be, uh, had been ingesting microplastic fibres. So she looked at three um, species. She looked at a gastropod, a sea star and a brittle star. Um, and she extracted almost 360 potential microplastics from these, from these organisms. Um, of these, 45 were identified as synthetic, 165 as cellulose, and 149 actually had no usable spectral data. Of the ones that were identified as synthetic, acrylic was the most abundant, and we found that there were nine different polymers that were identified from these, from these three species. The quantity between them, um, not only between the species, but the individuals also um, varied. Um, but we found that the brittle star, Ophia Museum here, actually ingested the greatest number of polymer types. So, um, you know, there were up to nine different polymer types that were being found. However, the sea star, the Hymenaster, actually had the greatest number of particles within the body. So some subtle differences occurring here. So we also took, for those of you who have not seen, um, we took some fibres, um, just to see what they look like. So the top one shows what a pristine fiber looks like. And then what happens when they've been ingested, as you can see here, by um, the different organisms. And also when they've been in the seawater, what happens? They become quite pitted. There's lots of crevices. They're no longer smooth and relatively straight. They're quite folded and bent in, in shape. And this allows for potentially for other um, pollutants to um, be absorbed onto the surface because there's a greater surface area. So one thing we were interested also in looking at was, was has microplastic concentration changed over time? So as I said, just I started this part about the deep sea, samples were being collected from 1975 and I restarted it in 2013 um, from this one location, Station M at 2,200 metres. So we were able to do a multi-decadal, um, sorry, a multi-decadal analysis um, and comparing the abundance of the ingested microplastics. And when I started this project with my student, we thought that what might happen is we would begin to see from the mid-1970s a slow, steady increase in the number of fibers um, in, these, in these animals, but that's not the case. I know 2013 is slightly anomalous, but it's still within the the range of the others, but from 1976 through to 2015, the number of microplastics per gram of wet weight of tissue is fairly constant, um, which was quite a surprise. So it suggests that, of course, that microplastics have been around it, even in the deep sea for a lot longer than we actually think. We're looking at the polymers that were identified from these um, three species. And we found that of the fibres, it was mainly acrylic, um, followed by polyester uh, and then polyethylene. Whereas when we looked at the actual fragments, we found that it was actually an alkyd resin that contributed to half of the, of the fragments that we were finding, followed by acrylic and then polyester. So it was a lot less diversity uh, in the fragments than in the fibres in, in terms of the polymers that we found. In, in the deep sea water that we collected, um, we collected 240 litres, just seven metres above the sea floor, and that we were finding there were about 71 fibres per metre cubed. Um, and this uh, image here just shows you what these fibres look like, so blues and reds. Um, the polymer com composition, again, slightly different to what we found before, this time mainly dominated by polyester um, and then acrylic. Going a step further, we also looked to see whether we could find the microplastics in the sediment and how deep into a sediment core that we found it. Uh, when I sent my student out, I was like, well, 
I think we'll only need to go to a depth of 10 centimeters. I doubt we'd need to go any further than that. Um, I was wrong. We found that microplastics were easily found down to a depth of 10 centimeters, which exceeds the age of plastic production. So 10 centimeters of sediment depth uh, in the rock or trough probably equates to about 150 years. Um, so it shows there's also a lot of bioturbation taking place in this um, area and the organisms are taking down sediment and the microplastics from the surface down to depth. So moving north then to another area I've been looking at, um, I've been very fortunate in some of the work I've been doing. I had the opportunity to go to the Arctic um, to see, you know, and it, to my mind, and even now to a certain extent, I still feel like this, you know, that the Arctic is seen as this pristine environment. Um, so I was interested in seeing whether microplastics were really going to be found in this pristine environment. So I went to a place called Svalbard, this location here, which is to the north of Norway. Um, and we were able to get off in, in this fjord here, Ritfjorden, and go for a walk. You can see um, it's a very striking scenery. There's lots of um, logs that are washed up on the beaches. And when you look at it like that, you think, wow, this is amazing. It's untouched. There's nobody here. There's nothing here. You then started, or I started to look more closely around the logs and started finding bits of fishing wire, um, fragments of plastic boxes, other bits of plastic bottles that were all um, washed up. You can see plastic bottle um, base here that were actually strewn in amongst the seaweed and the logs and the rocks um, all over the beach. And that was quite disheartening that we were so far north that about 80 degrees north, perhaps slightly less than that, I'm finding um, all this plastic. So that was the larger microplastics and we start, I decided to look at the microplastics. Um, I was fortunate that I was able to go to sea again um, and we were taking water samples along this transect here on the 30 degree east line through a project called Arctic Prize. It was looking at, um, at uptake of food or I was looking at uptake of food by the organisms but at the same time I thought this was a great opportunity to look to see whether um, there were actually microplastics in the water column. Um, so these were the stations that we had a look at. Um, so these were the plastic types. We found mainly fibres, almost 80% of the, um, the, the fibres that we found, 80% uh, of plastic that we found, sorry, were fibres. Um, and the colours were mainly split between sort of transparent and black. Now these were, um, this is results from 16 locations taken just below the surface of the water, so at five metres water depth, sort of the lowest or the shallowest you can take a CTD at. But at one location we were at, um, I think it was the furthest station north, um, we were able to sample down to a depth of over 3,000 metres and we found there were some differences. Um, there were there were again mainly fibres, almost 70% of them were fibres. Um, and they were more, they were mainly transparent. Over 70% of them were transparent. So we are finding microplastics uh, even up in the high, high Arctic, which is um, to my mind quite depressing. So another place I've worked, oh sorry, is um, in the Southwest Indian Ocean. So these are some of the images that we found um, on seamounts in the Southwest Indian Ocean. So not just plastics, but also litter. You can see here a glass bottle, um, bits of plumbing, old bits of tin and a discarded um, fishing net here. Um, and we looked to see about where, we looked at sort of litter and plastics across seamounts in different locations, not only in the Southwest Indian Ocean, but um, further afield. And we can see that it's quite closely related in terms of um, the, the fishing gear that we were finding is quite closely related to uh, where the shipping activity is. So we can see down here on the seamounts we were particularly interested in that the majority of the litter we were finding was actually plastic, or it was actually, sorry, it was actually fishing gear. And you can see here, 
these are the main fishing, um, these are the main shipping routes going over the top. And this is just a schematic showing you a bit more clearly. So from the Indian Ocean area, um, it was mainly fishing gear with a tiny bit of plastic um, and then something else. You come into the Atlantic Ocean um, and it's slightly different. There's sort of equal amounts of glass, um, of other, and then slightly less fishing gear. Um, and it's quite different depending on which sort of ocean that you are looking at. But in the Southwest Indian Ocean, on these seamounts, it was mainly fishing gear that we were finding. So what about microplastics? Well, we were looking, again, we were fortunate. We took some core samples and some coral uh, samples from these seamounts. Um, so you can see these are just off South Africa and to see what the microplastic content was like. We're just focusing on these three here, stations 10, 11, 12, um, which were these seamounts here. Um, and we're finding that yes, we're, there are microplastics and they're mainly polyester as well as other synthetics. This is from the sediment alone. Um, it's not as high as in other locations, but they are there and they are quite remote. So that was, um, I think, somewhat of a surprise. And it's not just um, on seamounts, but also in deep sea trenches. So we've been looking at trenches um, around the Pacific um, and have, over the years, colleagues have collected these large amphipods, um, their crustaceans, um, to see where the microplastics were there. And we looked in the hindgut of these amphipods, all nine sites, and we find, found that microplastics, um, either of man-made synthetic or semi-synthetic fibres, were in the hindguts of all these amphipods. And if we look here, this one here is actually the Mariana Trench, and every amphipod that was looked at had one or more plastic item within the hindgut of it. Um, and generally there was the, more than 50% of the amphipods had at least one item within it. More than 100 uh, plastic particles were identified into fibres and, and fragments. And we found that fibres were found in every trench um, that we looked at and appeared in a total of over 84% of, of the amphipods, whereas fragments only appeared in just under 20% of the amphipods. The fibres were mainly blue in colour, as you can see here, um, with some red fibres. Um, and again, the fragments were also mainly blue in colour. We start to think, well, why is it blue? Maybe it's the fishing nets, where, you know, often fishing nets are, are bluish in colour. So where are microplastics found? Well, this has come from the RV litter base where they pull in all the, as many papers as they can, which have been looking at microplastics. It's not just the marine environment. You might be wondering why there are microplastics on these, you know, on land. But I wanted to put this up just to show you the scale. Um, it shows you the scale of the research that's being undertaken by different people, um, but also the circles, as you can see. So all the purple is plastic but the size of the circles also gives you an idea of how much is being found. Um, it's mainly plastic, but there is some other types of litter also being collected as well. Where, it, where there are no dots doesn't mean there's no microplastic or litter found there. It's mainly because it's not been surveyed for, for plastics or for litter samples. A lot of the research we undertake isn't um, specifically going out to look for microplastics or litter, it's bolted onto the back of another project in the hope that we can try and find, do some other research when we're there. So before I finish, I just wanted to, to change tack slightly um, and speak a little bit about the impacts of COVID, um, this global pandemic that we're all being uh, impacted by. Um, and it's been quite interesting for me, I gave a talk recently and I stopped to think a little bit about how our lives have changed um, from a perspective of having to use more plastic. So pre-COVID, many people were using um, soap that came in bottles like this. And if we were traveling and there was no access to being able to wash your hands, um, if you were traveling abroad, you would take perhaps like hand sanitizer like this. 
But since COVID, we're being told to wash our hands much more frequently. And when you're out to hand san you know, to sanitize your hands with this sort of um, ethanol based hand sanitizer much more often. So the number of products that are being used has gone through the roof. And if you, a few months ago, if you were trying to buy soap, antibacterial soap like this, it was almost impossible because the shops had run out of it, at least here in the UK. In terms of shopping, um, I try and use uh, you know, reusable shopping bags wherever I can. Um, with, uh, with COVID, um, people who were getting um, deliveries home from their local supermarket or even were going to pick it up uh, from the store, but it had been collected by somebody else, were finding, yeah, you couldn't use your own shopping bag anymore. It was coming in plastic bags because everyone was so worried about the transmission of COVID and it made things much easier for everybody. So out go our recyclable bags and in come plastic bags. When we're out and about, we're being told now to wear masks. Um, if you go to the hospital or the doctor's surgery here in the UK, we're being given these disposable one-time use masks, um, which are plastic. People have, um, are, many people are using them because they find it easy rather than perhaps a reusable one. My plea is if you are using it, make sure you cut the, the, um, the straps here in half so they don't get wrapped around um, organisms when perhaps they get washed up on a beach somewhere. I know when I had to travel recently, um, this was the mask that I was, I was wearing because I, wanted, I don't want to use a, a disposable mask. Again, we have a coffee culture here. Um, we take uh, reusable mugs with us. And now that the coffee shops have reopened, out go those reusable mugs and back in come these disposable cups because they don't want transmission, accidental transmission from perhaps an unclean cup when they're making you your coffee. The same with water bottles, out have gone our reusable water bottles and in come these plastic water bottles. Many schools now are asking children to take in water bottles like this, which are then disposed of at school rather than taking in their reusable ones. So I just wanted to finish um, Going back up to the Arctic, this again, this what looks like pristine, um, beautiful environment. Looking through the water column here, you can't see any of the, of the plastics that are floating around, but we know, unfortunately, that they are, that they are there. And so just a few take home facts, um, if nothing else, that, you know, there are thought to be more than 5 trillion pieces of floating plastics in the world's oceans. Um, and that a washing machine may release up to 700,000 fibers per wash. Now kids love this when I say it to them, you, know, you can tell your parents, I don't need to clean, wash my clothes so often because I'm not adding to their number of fibers coming out into the washing machine. Unfortunately, COVID, which is impacting on all of us is also making us increase our use of plastic items, um, but we need to do more to reduce our dependence on, on plastic and single use plastic as much as possible. So I'd just like to thank you all for listening, um, for the various funders that have sponsored me during my um, different research projects that I've undertaken and the students that have worked with me. But I'd also really like to once again, thank uh, United Way Mumbai and NCCR, particularly Dr. Mishra, for inviting me to come and speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. It was indeed a very insightful uh, presentation also. It also says that even it's a microplastic, it, it needs a macro amounts of a giant amounts of efforts to understand uh, the details about it and the work you have done being in the harsh environment and finding those evidence that proves that you know it's it's a harmful thing and how we can mitigate it it's 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 commandable ma'am so uh, we i think and i'm uh, we are receiving a lot of comments positive comments from the youtube as well that the work that you and your team has done is amazing 
and i hope this research is helpful to develop some methodologies or to develop some products that uh, makes the environment of plastic free so ma'am uh, we will uh, do the question and answer session okay. now so i will be i will just read out the questions that participants have asked on okay. youtube and i'll just stop sharing my screen as well yes yes sure ma'am yes now it's proper so the first question is that the plastic or microplastic uh, plastic map indicate the higher qu quantity in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere either it could be due to more population or the less study conducted in the southern hemisphere it will my feeling is it's less studies less research has been undertaken on microplastics in this area and as i said the when you you get a research project at the minute it's not to go out and and look on the high seas for um plastics we bolt this um idea of of looking for litter onto the back of other programs so all many of the research campaigns have you know so the work i did in the southwest indian ocean and up in the arctic um was not plastic specific it was looking at other questions but we had the opportunity to do some research um on plastics in the area while we were there so i think it's more just that the work hasn't been done as of yet but it will come sure ma'am so ma'am next question is that uh, is there any studies going on re uh, regarding the amount of microplastic consumed by humans in their daily life there have been some studies um that have been undertaken um there was a study a few years ago i can't remember by whom but they they were looking to see whether if you ate um shellfish mussels um whether you would be ingesting or how many microplastic particles you would be ingesting um and yes you will be eating them but here in in colder climates where you have carpets on the floor which tend to be synthetic they will release many many more particles you will be inhaling these particles um much more frequently than you will do if you're eating um say shellfish or fish so there are some studies it's the ethics behind it that makes it a bit more difficult i think to actually be able to do them um at the minute ma'am the next relatable question is that uh, is the quantity of microplastics in the ocean is greater than the zooplankton number in the ocean is uh, what is the statistics over there i don't know the statistics but that has been um suggested that there are uh, a famous quote is there are more microplastics in the sea than there are fish um how you quantify that how you qualify that is very difficult because nobody actually knows how many zooplankton there are in the world's oceans or fish in the world's oceans and by the same token we don't actually know how many particles there are it's based on modeling and guesswork really but that that is the estimate that there are more uh micro microplastics than at least fish zooplankton Probably. No. yes true true and i have also recently read somewhere that uh, by 2025 there will be more plastic in the ocean than the fishes so every 3 tons of plastic there will be 1 ton of 3 tons of fishes there will be 1 ton of plastic so yeah. yeah 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 so definitely the amount of microplastics are very very high in number so ma'am uh, uh, due to time constraint we will just take last two questions okay. so the second last question is that can you please explain how to deal with this plastics that uh, gets generated during this pandemic that's very difficult um i, I think um we have to bear in mind that we are in a pandemic and we do have to make sure that we are doing as much as possible to reduce the transmission of the virus um however if we can all maybe not use the disposable masks use um reusable masks buy it use it wash it and then reuse it that's a much better way forward um if you're going out to take water from home rather than having to buy water from a from a shop things like that but but it is very difficult because people are very scared um but it requires all of us to do a little to try and um 
reduce the amount of plastic in terms of co in terms of this COVID pandemic. Um, if we can try and reduce it as much as possible. True, very true. It should be the collective efforts and the change in mindset that we all require nowadays. Also, the, the next question is that, uh, is there any study ongoing to replace or to bring us sustainable plastic products? And uh, are there any bacteria which can reduce the amount of plastic? So there are various studies, various companies that are looking into um, producing products that will replace plastics. Um, there is a company um, that is on the same site as my, labor my laboratory that are producing a material to try and replace plastics. Um, and that seems to be working well. It, it comes from the shells of langoustines. So they, they use chitin from the langoustine shells, work their magic, shall I say on it? I don't know the process really. Um, and then they create a, a film from it, which they can use to wrap products in to increase the shelf life in the same way that we would do with plastics. In terms of bacteria, um, again, I'm not sure enough. I don't do enough in terms of bacterial ecology and knowing whether they will, whether there will be or are bacteria that will be eating enough plastic to actually perhaps remove it from the from the planet. Yeah, very true. And it also depends on the polymers that are, they are made up of different polymers. So the yeah. one bacteria cannot digest all the different types of polymers that has been used to make the plastic. So yeah, it, it, it's difficult, but um, we all are trying to you know, yeah. reduce. So ma'am, one last question that I personally want to ask you that, uh, have like now you have done this amazing research and now you know the seriousness of this problem so can you tell us the hacks that you have uh, uh, included in your day-to-day -day life uh, to reduce uh, the or reuse the plastic products because sometimes we cannot es escape the plastics you know because you have yes. to something so do, do can you just tell us like quick hacks that you have incorporated or you have heard of that we all could incorporate it in our day-to-day -day life so I um, carry a reusable shopping bag with me wherever I go. Um, I will carry my own water bottle and my own uh, coffee cup with me. Um, I've trained my children to say no to plastic straws. Um, lots of, not so many now they've reduced, but you know, if you're out, um, you don't even need a straw to say, I don't want one of those, please. Um, just stop and think when you purchase things, do you, you know how much plastic wrapping is coming in it? If you buy, and again, it's very consumer driven um, here, um, fruit comes bagged up already. I will actively go and select um, produce that's not in a bag and I'll take a mesh bag instead and put my fruit in it or my vegetables in it um, rather than it being already pre-packaged. It's little things like that that I think are important. Not to use, you know, cleaning wipes, you know, use a cloth instead of that. Um, I think it, it depends on everyone's lifestyle, but if you start looking around your house, your flat, your apartment, at what you have that's plastic and start thinking about what else you could use instead of it, um, that goes you know, a long way. Think about the, the cloths you use to to wash the dishes, um, a lot of those have plastic in it. And there are now many products available where you don't have to use plastic any longer. True, true that uh, I also very much agree that, you know, sometimes we cannot escape, but we as a consumer, when we start choosing uh, our options, our as per our convenience, then probably it will create a larger impact on the producers. And maybe one day everybody will be talking like this topics as a normal dining table conversation that we hope for that, you know, yeah, today we are not using the plastics or, you know, the climate change problems uh, that we are causing. Yeah. Uh, through our lifestyle. So we really hope that these conversations become a daily conversations, not, you know, just a special day occasions. And once again, thank you very, very much, ma'am, for joining us. And it's been delight 
grateful to have you and you have shared some amazing information that we personally did not know about the washing machine uh, plastics and the other uh, research methodology that you have explained and the research and thank you very much ma'am uh, so on the behalf of united way mumbai and nccr we are very grateful for uh, you to have us on the last day of the series uh, and uh, one more request uh, announcement i would like to make for the participants that the feedback form link ha already has been pasted in the chat uh, comment section so please click on the feedback form link and uh, you will get your certificate within 20 working days also uh, today is international uh, uh, coastal cleanup day so we are again having a new uh, last uh, online series uh, which is a panel discussion where we will be talking about in detail about the effects of covid-19 waste on our ocean so please uh, do join us and you will be also soon getting an email regarding the joining link and everything so ma'am also you are also welcome very very welcome to attend that thank you yes thank you very much ma'am and have a lovely day you too and thank you everyone for listening thank you thank you babani no problem thank you it is mishra thanks thank you for inviting me yeah thanks thanks for the nice talk <laughs>